Hello there. Welcome to another Fireside Chat. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chazel Giudello. And if you miss Play America on Wednesday night, it's on Ivy YouTube and Facebook. But this isn't it. Nope. This is our second chattier show. The one with the fake fire rather than the fake Resolute Desk. It's easy to tell the difference, <laughs> and there is much to chat about again this week. This weekend marks one year until the 2024 presidential election. The campaign has already been underway for a year, so I guess we're at the midpoint. Good time to take stock. Yeah, and helping us to do that will be Ryan Lizza from Politico, who will be joining us right here shortly. But first... The escalating war in Gaza and Israel has seen demonstrations from supporters of both sides in many American cities this week and on college campuses with widespread claims of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. It's also opening up divisions within the Democratic Party. President Biden's support of Israel has alienated some on the political left, including some African-American activists who identify with the Palestinian cause. 18 House Democrats, all of them people of colour, co-sponsored a ceasefire resolution this week. And do remember, it was division over a Democratic president's support for the Vietnam War that tore the party apart in 1968, saw Lyndon Johnson ultimately decide not to stand for re-election and cleared the way for Republican Richard Nixon. So there is historical precedence for this chance. Yeah, Biden's in a tough spot for sure. The National Muslim Democratic Council sent Biden what they called an ultimatum last week, saying that his administration had played a significant role in perpetuating the violence that's causing civilian casualties. They asked them to secure a ceasefire by the 31st of October or they would mobilise Muslim, Arab and allied voters to withhold their support for him. Needless to say, the deadline has passed, no ceasefire, mm. and they might not need to try very hard to mobilise against Biden, John, because the polling is already speaking volumes. According to an Arab American Institute poll, just 17% of Arab-American voters support the president, down from 59% in 2020. And, of course, the largest Arab-American community in America is found in Michigan, a crucial swing state, as well as substantial numbers of Arab-Americans in Pennsylvania and Georgia. Which would be a huge headache for Joe Biden, were it not for the fact that his likely rival, Donald Trump, is already talking about a renewed Muslim ban, so it's hard to see him winning over too many Arab-American votes, but we'll see. Mm. There's plenty of pressure being applied to supporters of the Palestinian Palestinian cause within the Democratic Party as well, including the only Palestinian American in Congress, Rashida Tlaib. This ad was made by a Democratic pro-Israel group. It aired in Tlaib's home district of Michigan this week. She's one of only seven Democrats in Congress to vote against missile protection for Israel. One of only nine Democrats against condemning the brutal attack on Israel by Hamas. Her legislation will allow the terrorists to rearm themselves. And she refuses to answer even this horrific question. You can't comment about Hamas terrorists chopping off baby pets. Tell Rashida to leave. She's on the wrong side of history and humanity. That's from Democrats? That's from Democrats. Right. On the wrong side of history and humanity. Wow. It's pretty tough stuff. So is rehashing some of those Fox News chopping off babies' heads questions that we featured a couple of weeks ago. And fact checkers at the Pointer Institute, for instance, still refer to those reports as uncorroborated and a weekly sourced claim, but they're already being used as Democrat attack ads against Democrats. As you say, John, it's really hard to find confirmation of the bedded babies claim. Uh, there were a number of journalists at that same kibbutz who said they saw no evidence of it at all, uh, and they, they said that no soldiers mentioned it to them personally. Uh, that doesn't mean it didn't happen, though. Uh, Netanyahu's office tweeted out a picture of what appeared to be a beheaded baby that had been burnt. You couldn't really tell, to be honest. I will not be showing you that photo for obvious reasons, but we don't even know where that photo came from. I should also say that a few non-Israeli government people have claimed to have witnessed beheaded babies at other sites in the last few weeks. This is Eli Beer, the founder of Unite Hatzler, a community-based volunteer EMS organisation in Israel. I saw little kids who were beheaded. We didn't know which head belongs to which kid. I was crying for five days straight. I couldn't get out. Of, I couldn't stop crying. Yeah, certainly a very harrowing account. As the humanitarian crisis in Gaza deepens, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken will be back in Israel Friday local time and will reportedly call for humanitarian pauses in the fighting to allow food, water and other urgently needed aid to reach Gaza, as well as to help with hostage releases. 
With so much misinformation and propaganda flying around at the moment, it is very hard to get a clear picture as to what is happening in Gaza right now. But the head of the World Health Organization did release this video earlier today. The situation on the ground in Gaza is indescribable. Hospitals crammed with the injured, lying in corridors, morgues overflowing, doctors performing surgery without anesthesia, thousands of people seeking shelter from the bombardment, families crammed into overcrowded schools desperate for food and water, toilets overflowing and the risk of disease outbreaks spreading, and everywhere, fear, death, destruction, loss. It's too late to help the dead now, but we can help the living. You know, even Israelis seem to be wanting to take a breather from this. A poll in the Mara of newspaper last week found only 29% of Israelis wanted the military to immediately escalate to a large-scale ground offensive, whereas 49% thought it would be better to wait. Mm. Only a week ago, it was 65% of Israelis who supported the ground offensive. So 65% to 29% support in one week says it all. Of course, we don't know what caused that change of mind amongst the Israelis, but it was last week that we started seeing the first classic hostage videos from those captured by Hamas, like this one here. And that video ramps up even more as it goes on. So the hostages might be playing on Israeli minds. Maybe they're reacting to what's happening in Gaza. This week, a refugee camp was bombed on multiple occasions. The IDF claimed that they killed about 50 terrorists, as well as destroyed entrances to terrorist tunnels and weapons. They also claimed to have killed one of the key plotters of the October 7 attacks. Meanwhile, the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry says the Israeli strikes killed and wounded hundreds, a statement that could not be immediately verified. So, let's say the IDF actually hit who they said they hit. Is that trade-off worth it? It's an open question. Wolf Blitzer doesn't seem so sure. But even if that uh, uh, Hamas commander was there amidst all those Palestinian refugees who are in that, in that Jabalia refugee camp, Israel still went ahead and, and dropped a bomb there, attempting to kill this, Hamas, uh, this Hamas, Hamas commander, knowing that a lot of innocent civilians, men, women and children, presumably would be killed. Is that what I'm hearing? This is the tragedy of war, Wolf. I mean, we... As you know, we've been seeing for days, move south. Civilians are not involved with Hamas. Please move south. Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to get we, a little bit more information. Uh, you knew there were civilians there. You knew there were refugees, all sorts of refugees. But you decided to still drop a bomb on that refugee camp attempting to kill the Hamas commander. By the way, was he killed? I can't confirm yet. I'll, there'll be more uh, updated. He, yes, we know that he was killed. Um, about the civilians there, we're doing everything we can to minimize. Uh, I'll tell it, I'll say it again. Sadly, they are hiding themselves within civilian population. And again, we are doing this stage by stage, and we're going to go after every one of these terrorists who was involved in that heinous attack on the 7th of October. Wolf. So that's where we've been until now. Mm. Now, just this week, the IDF held a press conference to explain that they believe Hamas's military headquarters was under our Shifa Hospital. Full of fancy graphics and whatnot, their presentation. I should say, it's not a surprising claim. This has been an open secret for at least a decade. Back in 2014, the Washington Post openly wrote that the Shifa Hospital has become a de facto headquarters for Hamas leaders, who can be seen in the hallways and offices. But regardless, the IDF held that press conference for a reason, John. Mm. So if they're about to go into this major hospital with lots of bang-bangs and explosions... That could be an even greater humanitarian and not to mention international PR disaster. And one more thing, 
in every one of these reports of airstrikes, uh, you're going to see a reference to the Gaza Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the only source, the only official source for Gaza casualties because Israel has sealed Gaza's borders, banning foreign journalists. You'll often see it pointed out, just like I did a couple of minutes ago, that they're controlled by Hamas and their numbers have not been verified. So, how trustworthy are those numbers then? As far as Biden is concerned, not much. I'm sure innocents have been killed and it's the price of waging a war, but I have no confidence in the number that the Palestinians are using. Obviously, the Gaza Ministry of Health wasn't thrilled by that review from the president. Mm. So the next day, it released the names of the almost 7,000 Gazans killed at that point in time by Israeli airstrikes, according to them. Uh, and ID numbers too. And to be fair, we should note that in the past, the UN has found Gaza Ministry of Health figures accurate to within four percentage points. Also, not completely accurate to say that they're totally controlled by Hamas because the Palestinian Authority retains power over health and education services in Gaza. Also, the Palestinian Authority still pays health ministry salaries to this day. So it is complicated. Having said all that, I would remain cautious because look at that hospital that got hit two weeks ago. At 5.27pm, Al Jazeera ran a report from the Gazan Health Ministry saying that hundreds of victims were under the rubble of a Gazan hospital compound that was hit. Yet, it turned out, there was no compound hit, it was a car park. And look at the photo from soon after the explosion, there's no rubble. So that is all very unsatisfying, John. Such is the nature of war. Yep, indeed. A lot of lies are being told, but we also know many, many thousands of lives are being lost. And those opinion polls uh, around Israeli attitudes, hugely important because Benjamin Netanyahu managed very well on to deflect some of the blame for the astonishing intelligence failure that allowed the October 7th attacks. Uh, but now that opinion is swinging against, as Israelis are seeing, well, the claimed death toll is now five, six, sevenfold the Israeli casualties. Mm -hmm. uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is on very thin political ground himself, may be fighting for his political life with the literal lives of many Israelis and Gazans right now. As expected back in Washington, D.C., the new Republican House Speaker, MAGA Mike Johnson, is pushing ahead with a standalone funding bill for Israel. It flies in the face of White House wishes, though, to link Israeli aid to spending for Ukraine and U.S. border security. Even more irksome for Democrats is that this Republican House bill pays for $14 billion plus in aid to Israel by slashing funding to the IRS, the tax office money that Democrats secured just last year to step up tax compliance and close loopholes being exploited by wealthy tax avoiders. This suggests to some that MAGA Mike is not the compromise-driven pragmatist that some had held out hope for. This is a very, very partisan play, which immediately sets up a showdown with the Democrat-dominated Senate and possibly exposes, exposes some Republican divisions in the Senate there as well, Chaz. Yeah, we, we should be clear... This is, there's no chance this is going to get up. I mean, the, the fact that they are taking $14 billion away from IRS enforcement means mm. that the CBO, that's the budgeting office, has said it's actually going to cost $26 billion. It'll cost more mm. than it raises because they could take money away from tax enforcement. Right. So there, there's no way that, that, that this is going to get through. Also, I might add, just a, just a little bit of bastardry in, in, in this particular mm. thing. One of, the, one, one of the things that they zeroed out was a free program for taxpayers to, to they, don't, they don't have to hire an accountant co company to, to, to pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. They can use a free service from the government. They zeroed that out as well. So that's, that's kind of horrible. But having said that, I think there is a logic to this. Like, a, 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 I don't know if you're referring to me when you're talking about people hoping for a rational compromise. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, Some are hoping for rationality. But, but I, never said that, I never said he'd be accommodating. I just mm. said I just said he seems to me to be very very rational and very clever. And you could argue and it is rational right now to make a partisan play to say thanks very much to the people that voted for him made him speaker. Yeah, uh, well, in particular, if you if you think that you're struggling to get something through, because mm. there are a number of Republicans who just aren't going to fund Israeli aid. Like for instance, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she's just not going to do it. Mm. Um, and so and so he's got a very small margin to work with. So he needs to throw him some red meat just to get anything through. But also, I think there might be another another bit of logic to this, which is that 
the biggest knock on Mike Johnson from the beginning was that he's replacing Kevin McCarthy. Moneybags Kevin McCarthy. Exactly. One of the great fundraisers. Like, we're talking the best part of $100 million worth of fundraising. Yeah. Uh, but Mike Johnson, he's he's pulled the pockets out, Paul. Mm, like he mm. doesn't raise money at all. Like he's 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 got yeah, a few thousand dollars in his bank account essentially, and so he's not a very good replacement for Kevin McCarthy. So I could see. Just think about what he's giving up here. What he's giving up here. He he wasn't the price. The price for this bill was not, oh, drop the indictment for Trump, or some kind of MAGA priority. Mm. It was help out the rich guys. I think he's saying we're open for business to the rich guys. It he's, does send a signal, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's what's going on here. He mm. knew this wasn't going to get up. Yep. But he just wants to send out a signal, please start donating, we're going to look after you. And mm. uh, that would be a rational thing to do if that's what he was doing. If it is, but for not, sure. But not useful. Yeah, <laughs> good point. Uh, another interesting development this week, the six-week auto workers' strike has come to an end, it seems, with an in-principle agreement with Detroit's big three for General Motors and Stellantis Chrysler. The workers walked off the job over stagnant pay, concessions that they'd made dating back to the global financial crisis in 2008, and concerns that they still have about the transition of the automakers to electric vehicles and how it was all being managed. Perspective contract calls for raises of about 25% over four years. It'll raise the top wage to more than $40 an hour, including an increase of 68% for starting wages to more than $28 an hour. There will be other benefit increases as well, and Ford says it's looking forward to getting three of its truck plants back up and running and getting its 20,000 employees back to work. Well, Joe Biden made history early in this dispute by literally joining a union picket line, albeit briefly. It was the first time an American president had ever done that. And this week, he was claiming victory for the union movement and also for his vision of America. Today's historic agreement is yet another piece of good economic news showing something I've always believed. Worker power. Worker power is critical to building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up. And so is economic growth. And former President Donald Trump also inserted himself into this industrial dispute. You recall he travelled to Michigan, a crucial swing state in presidential elections. He was talking, though, to non-union workers and blaming the push to electric cars for the whole dispute at the time. But this does seem, Chaz, like a win for Joe Biden. He arguably aligned himself with the auto workers' union, wrapped his arms around them in much the same way as he did with Netanyahu and Israel early in that conflict, in this one, he comes away with a political win in line with his values. What happens with Israel and whether that's in line with his values and whether it represents a political win is still very much an open question. Yeah, like I think I think he did come very well out of this. I mean, the union, the union movement in general is not as pro-democrat as it used to be, mm. even though they do fund the Democrats to a certain extent, um, and certainly the union workers aren't so pro-Democrat, and I think that uh, he, he might have won himself a few votes with the, the support. I should say that there are some people uh, are being pessimistic about this deal, suggesting it's inflationary, because mm. it's not just 25% pay rises, by the way, there's also a cost of living adjustment. Mm. So over the four years, it's probably going to be more like 33% pay, pay rise, and people go, well, that's a lot of pay rise. But mm. also, they're covering a lot of ground when, from times when they didn't get pay rises. Yeah. Like, they, the first year sees an 11% pay rise, that alone had, does, not, does not make up for the inflation in just the last three yeah. years. And ultimately, we are yeah. talking about experienced workers getting $40 an hour. Mm. President Biden pointing out in his speech this week that, uh, you know, maybe this is an old guy getting nostalgic for the good old days of the 50s when we made the best cars in the world. But in those days, an auto worker, usually in those days a man, would earn enough to buy a house, own their own car, maybe a second one, and raise a family. You cannot do that on, on an auto worker's wage now. Even if there is a second wage, you're looking at third and fourth jobs just to make ends meet. And in Michigan as well, the auto industry dominated this level by African Americans and Hispanic Americans as well. So this is very much a, a play to that audience, as well as being, I think, Joe Biden believes, the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I think it's a reasonable deal. I actually, I actually suspect in the long run, the most significant part of this deal is that they have opened up the possibility of strikes in for future plant closures mm -hmm. and, and plant openings, which is going to be a big deal 
when the transition happens to electric cars. They're going to have completely mm. different plans. Yeah. And so the, the fear has always been that when the transition happens, all the, the rights of workers just mm. fades away with these new plants. They've earned the right to strike when yeah. that happens. And so, it's not just the big automakers. It's the component makers and mm. all the other people that made all the bits and pieces in an internal combustion engine that are now suddenly redundant or, or yeah. about to become so. Yeah. Well, joining us in a moment on the Fireside Chat is Politico Chief Washington Correspondent Ryan Lizza. But before we get to him, a reminder of what is probably still his most famous interview from 2017, an expletive-laden chat with then White House Communications Director Anthony Scaramucci, who was venting about the Chief of Staff in the Trump administration, Ryan Priebus, accusing him of illegal leaking revealing, as it did, some of the deep dysfunction and infighting in the Trump administration's early days. And within days of these comments, the mooch was sacked after just 11 days in the job. And Ryan is a paranoid schizophrenic, paranoiac. And what he's going to do is, oh, maybe Bill Shine's coming. Or Let me leak the thing and see if I can block these people the way I block Scaramucci for six months. OK, but, but he leaked the CFIA stuff on me. Uh, you know, my financial disclosure has been leaked to Politico. Well, the man who was on the other end of that phone call, <laughs> Ryan Lizza, is in Australia at the moment as a guest of the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney. Ryan Lizza, welcome to the Fireside Chat. Thank you for having me. A uh, real blast from the past there. I, I have not listened to that, I think, in six years. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> when you were listening to that the first time, were you thinking, this guy is talking himself out of a job? What were you thinking? Um, I was thinking he was um, not the most adept uh, spokesperson for uh, for the White House. And <laughs> was um, you know just sort of thrown into a job that he was not prepared for, like a lot of early Trump uh, Trump officials. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I look, I knew that was going to be a very newsworthy interview. Um, in fact, the last time I, I talked to Anthony was uh, when we were ready to publish that. I called him and said, Anthony, you know, I just want to make sure that we have the same understanding, um, uh, that this was an on-the-record conversation. Uh, we, we, you know, we are going to publish our, our, our interview. You we were vending quite, quite a bit. It's going to be very newsworthy. And he said, yeah, yeah, the, it, was, it wasn't off the record, obviously. It was on the record. Um, but if you publish that, I'll never talk to you again. <laughs> but he that, has. He and has that, and then, of course, no, uh, I'm pretty sure he has. It. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> win win. Yeah. And then, you know, once someone says that, you're, you know, you yeah. you're, 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 you're publishing no matter what. Um, no, I don't think, you know, no, I don't. I, he, he doesn't work in, um, he didn't work with the White House anymore, sure. so there was no. And you don't want to invest with his firm, I can understand that. <laughs> now, this weekend, Ryan marks one year until the presidential election. We're going to be on air all that time, you're going to be on air all that time, but. You want to put us out of our misery? What's going to happen? Who's going to win? We don't know anything. We don't know what's going to. We don't know. It's it's too soon to know if I, I, if Joe Biden and Donald Trump will actually be the nominees. Right? There's a non-zero possibility that neither of them will be the nominee. Mm -hmm. We assume it's going to be a rematch. We don't know if Donald Trump will be facing jail time, right? Or if all of these uh, criminal cases just sort of uh, uh, are dissolve, or you know, he's uh, ex exonerated. Um, we don't know if this primary challenge from Representative Dean Phillips of Minnesota is going to have some effect on the Democratic primaries in the in the winter and spring, our winter and spring. Um, you know, we don't know where the economy is going to be. We don't know what new Supreme Court opinions are going to intrude on this election. Um, we don't know what uh, the our House of Representatives, how many. Uh, cycles of, you know, speaker fights uh, we're going to go through. I mean, you know, if you, it seems like low chances that uh, speaker, uh, that your viewers will need to remember Speaker Johnson's <laughs> uh, name six months from now. I mean, maybe he'll, he'll, he'll surprise us, but he, have this, he has the same sword hanging over his head that Kevin McCarthy did. So there are just so many unknowns, and I think the, the mistake we all make as pundits is just take conditions at this moment today and um, put them forward one year and then say, what's the election going to be like, right? A couple of weeks ago, there was no war between Israel and Hamas, yeah. right? Now that is literally driving American politics. That didn't exist a couple of weeks ago. Mm. It's created whole new fissures in both parties. Um, you know, think about the Dobbs decision and the midterms. We didn't know that the, our midterm elections were going to come down or were going to be greatly influenced by the, the, the overturning of, of Roe v. Wade. So that's a very long way of saying, <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> I, I think you can say, you know, you could safely 
On the other hand, no matter what happens, no matter how many different crazy things there are, our elections have been incredibly close in recent years, mm -hmm. right? So we have all of these disruptions. We have an insurrection, and we have abortion rights being changed, and we have, um, you know, n new wars that we're we're spending tons of money on, and our elections tend to be tend to be um, decided in a very narrow range. That's a good answer. There's obviously a lot of unknowns. Let's talk about unknown. That, uh, there is an assumption here, though. The known is third-party candidates. Great question. Yeah. yeah. Now, the, now we, there is an assumption here that they're going to get on the ballot. And I, every time people bring up the third-party candidates, I go, talk to me when they're on the ballot. Fair. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, we make it very hard to get on the ballot in the States. Totally. So yeah. let's say, let's assume for the purposes of this discussion, yeah. that Cornell West and RFK Jr. are on at least 40 states each, let's say. For, for the purposes of this discussion. Okay. That's uh, a big deal. That would be a big deal. Yeah. At, at this point in time, as you say, let's not look at the polls now and project forward, but the, there were ridiculously high numbers among it. Quinnipiac had a poll just the other day where RFK in a three-way had 22% had of the vote and in a, in a four-way with Cornell West, he had 19% and Cornell West had 6% of the vote. Yeah. Now, I think we can assume that well, maybe we can't assume. You tell me. <laughs> if, if, if there's any chance that they will get anything like those numbers, and if, and if they get smaller numbers, how much of a factor do you think they could be in this election? It is a great question. A lot of Democratic strategists are obsessed with this question mm. because they look at 2016 and 2020, and they see the big difference as third-party candidates. In 2016, that, that, that swing group that we were talking about, you know, it, uh, I was trying to isolate it in the sort of suburbs of, of some of these uh, Midwest and Sunbelt states in, in, in the U.S., there, there's a group of voters, and whether they live in that, that area or, or, or in other places, anti-Hillary and anti-Trump voters, people who hated, uh, we call them double doubters, mm -hmm. people who hated Hillary and hated Trump in 2016, that was the swing vote. They broke for Trump, and the ones that and, and then one, and then Hillary lost some because a lot of them went to third-party candidates, and some argue that without the Jill Stein on the ballots, that Hillary um, could have um, could have won the electoral college. 2020, there was not that third-party option. The um, the double doubters uh, broke, and they didn't have the option, uh, even if they hated Biden, of going uh, to a third party, mm -hmm. and so. If you, if you do the math, you could argue that that was the difference between Hillary losing and Biden winning. So now you're, under your scenario, you've got two thirds. You, you've got you've got a, a left, and are, you know Kennedy is sort of now considered a a candidate of the populist right. Mm -hmm. At the, Quine, the Quinnipiac poll that you mentioned, he was actually taking more from Donald Trump than from Joe Biden. And I think it's a fascinating dynamic. What happened with him is he jumps into the Democratic primary. The Democrats go after him, right? And and so his the his the Kennedy name, of course, is very strong. He shoots up in the polling against Biden, but then Democrats go after him. A lot of negative information is released about him. A lot of Democrats change their mind. Uh, his poll numbers uh, go down, but at the same time, Republicans think, "Oh, we'll mess around in the de in the Democratic primary, mess with Joe Biden, and we'll build this guy up." So he became a feature of Fox News. Donald Trump would say nice things about him. Tucker Carlson would say nice things about him. And there was this sort of, you know, semi-coordinated -co strategy on the right to make Kennedy um, a thing. But what happened was he, all of his fans changed from being like progressive, you know, uh, 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 ancestral uh, Kennedy Democrats to being conservative populists. So his base now is much more on the right. Then he jumps out of the Democratic primary, says he's going to run as an independent, and the Trump people freak out yeah. because they've helped build him up now. So um, under the scenario you laid out, Cornell West takes less from Biden than Kennedy takes um, from Trump. So, so that scenario it seems like a bigger danger uh, for Trump, but who knows? I mean, that's... Uh, we got to see with it with the Kennedy mm. phenomenon if it dies out, if he gets on the ballot, if he, if he goes anywhere. But 22 percent, if you're, you know, that's a big number. Let's talk about the Republican primary. We've got the third Trumpless debate next week. <laughs> uh, we've seen Ron DeSantis sort of you know, just trailing down ever since he launched his campaign in the last six weeks or so. We've seen Nikki Haley taking a little bit uh, of that slack. 
Tim Scott fading as well. What do you make of the dynamics there? And ultimately, do you think any of it matters because they're still all 40 points behind Donald Trump? I, I do think that if there's consolidation, if it becomes, you know, the whole game, this is why it's not crazy for one of these guys, for these guys to be running, right? There's some small chance you could get into a, you know, something happens to Trump and you, and you could take off. So we've, we've, we've been watching this primary and saying, what's the point of this? Trump's going to win. He's dominating the race. Um, but, you know, there's a, there is a, there's a slim uh, path for, for, uh, for the right, a whole set of things have to happen, but it exists, right? Um, the first thing is that you've got to get into a one-on-one -on -one with Trump. So the whole game is a, is a sort of, um, the, the non-Trump portion of the primary is just survivor, right? Who's gonna be the final person against Trump? In, in 2016, that was a, you know, that, that was a good place to be when Ted Cruz, and um, uh, it never got to one-on-one -on -one because of, uh, of um, Kasich. because of John Kasich. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, there was a, there was a chance there. It, it turned into a race at the end. And I think there's a decent chance. It always turns into more of a race than we think in, in a primary. I, I think there will be consolidation. Most of these guys will drop out because they don't have the money. And there will be a one-on-one a, a -on -one against Trump. I suppose my take on, on this is that, the, is that it's unfortunate for, the, for people who want an interesting horse race that, uh, that Haley and DeSantis have completely different support bases. So, they're not, so one isn't going to pick, pick votes up off the other. And basically, Haley is going to pick up whatever Tim Scott the drops on the floor when he goes. Yeah, well, some, of his guy, some of his voters will go to Trump. Yeah, yeah some of yeah, them, yeah, sure. Yeah, but, 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 yeah, but DeSantis will pick up some of Ramaswamy's votes when he goes. Yeah. And so you've got a situation where both of them have basically 20%. Yeah, and, and 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 so neither of them has a reason to drop out. Exactly, and they're just going to be waiting for exactly. the other one. So you have another three-way, which is but so exactly. My, yeah. So that's why it's a repeat of 2016, likely. And mm. and, and like Vivek, I, you know, if he thinks he's helping Trump by staying in, mm. I feel like that's that's his mo, mm. right? That he'll that he would stay in just for that reason. Let's go through scenarios. Trump's convicted, yeah. but doesn't go to jail. Trump's convicted, but goes to jail. Trump isn't convicted but has a terrible trial. In any of those scenarios, yeah. is there an opening for anyone else in the Republican Party? That's a really good question. I mean, so far, indictments correlate with surges in the polls for Trump. Mm. Yes. <laughs> to the point where his campaign, you know, or I think he himself has joked, you know, uh, another indictment would be great for him, right? Mm. Because uh, it has been a backlash against the um, Department of Justice and these state and local prosecutors, and it's helped him consolidate the field. It's sort of made the whole primary about him and his him being persecuted. Um, you know, his line, they're not indicting him, they're indicting you. Um, so, and his opponents have looked at that dynamic and sort of thrown their hands up and said, you know, usually you think it's a pretty good thing if your opponent gets indicted. Usually, <laughs> right? yes. I mean, I've never run for office, but I think I would have a good case to make. Yeah. But so these guys are, you know, they, they, they have to look at this and think, oh, you know, even, even an indicted Donald Trump, I, I, can't, I can't touch him. So the next stage of the process is, all right, what if he's convicted? What if he's being sent to jail? Will his voters finally realize that it's a better, you know, if I'm Ron DeSantis, that it's a better bet to have, you know, all the Trumpy things you like, but in a, in a more electable package, if you believe that's true. Some people don't believe that's true and on the electability portion. So I think, you know, they ha they're all crossing their fingers and hoping for Trump, a Trump collapse, like a, a, a meteor. Like, they can't do it themselves. They haven't figured out a way to take him down. I don't think there's any other Republican who would be doing a better job. I don't think it, it can't be done. Trump's bond with the Republican base is that, it is that strong. There's no one that sort of has picked the lock and no one, no one like that's going to come along. So they, they, have to, they have to root for some kind of um, uh, meteor-like event. I think the conviction and no jail, no, that doesn't change it. That feeds into his persecution complex. He runs on cleaning up the Justice Department to make sure this doesn't happen to other Republicans and going after his enemies. Jail, then as a voter, you might have to, as a Trump voter, you might have to think, uh, you know, maybe this isn't the best circumstances for, 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 the, for the second Trump term. I mean, and we laugh, but this is a, this is a, uh, not just a non-zero uh, probability. This is a uh, this is a scenario with 
you know, double digit percentage chance that the likely nominee of the Republican Party is facing jail time. Mm. Brian Lizzie, great to meet you. Thanks for having a fireside chat. Thank you guys so much. This is great. Well, you move chairs fast. Now, we had a really great <laughs> conversation on Planet America this week with independent presidential candidate, academic and civil rights activist Cornell West. And there was a lot we didn't have time to put to air midweek. So here's some more for you. Professor, what do you think of Robert Kennedy Jr.? And what effect do you think, if any, his campaign could have on yours? Well, I love my brother. I've worked with him uh, in the past, environmental racism uh, issues. I have deep disagreements with him. As you know, he's even further to the right on Israel than Biden is. He said that IDF had never deliberately killed one innocent person since 1948. And you know, he's living in cuckoo land. I told him he's got to get off the crack pipe if he doesn't understand the ways in which the Israeli defense forces have disproportionately uh, 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 led toward the uh, activities disproportionately led toward the death of innocent people in what three over three thousand children in just two and a half weeks. So, RFK Jr., we have profound disagreements when it comes to foreign policy. There's no doubt about that. We overlap in terms of our critique of the corporate dominant domination of the economy. Uh, but uh, but he's he's uh, he's a different kind of candidate. He's, he thinks for himself. I appreciate him when he's right, and I go at him intensely when he's wrong. And we shall see how uh, our candidacies uh, affect the uh, the election. And uh, it's hard to say. It's too early, I think, my brother, to say exactly what the relation would be between his independent candidacy and my independent candidacy. And what do you think of some of the comments that Kennedy has made, anti-scientific, some would say, frankly, very dangerous, even deadly comments, such as when he cast doubt on the effectiveness of the mumps, measles and rubella vaccine in American Samoa. Dozens of people died in an epidemic after vaccination rates went down following his visit. People say he has blood on his hands. Yeah, I do think that he, he makes uh, unwarranted claims. I know he would argue against me, but I think he makes certainly exaggerated claims. If people take those claims seriously, it could lead towards some very, very dangerous uh, situations, if not death itself. I wouldn't say that he's personally causally responsible, but I would say he's part of a whole cacophony of voices that uh, that can mislead people. There's no doubt about that. Um uh, and so he and I, again, you know, we've got deep disagreements when it comes to uh, how do we understand uh, the relation between U.S. health policies on the one hand and vaccine practices on the other. I think he is right, though, in terms of the pharmaceutical company companies having a disproportionate influence on U.S. health policy. I do think he's right about that, but that's very different than to talk about his own theories about vaccines and his confusion of correlation and causation when, it, when he's talking about autism on the one hand and when he's talking about various pills on the other. Finally, Cornel West, I wonder how you feel about your legacy and your reputation. You're a man in his 70s now. That's a time when people start to think how history is going to remember them. Are you concerned about maybe being remembered as the person who got Donald Trump elected by siphoning away votes from Joe Biden, that, like Ralph Nader leading to the uh, Afghan and Iraq wars under George W. Bush, or Jill Stein leading to Donald Trump's presidency? That is how some progressives, some Democrats, are going to remember you now. Well, no, I don't... I'm not that preoccupied with, with the legacy of reputation. I, I have a particular calling and vocation, uh, and in doing that... Uh, I, 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 I have to be true to myself. Uh, I don't. I don't view life in terms of uh, some utilitarian calculation in a narrow political form. I think there's certain spiritual and moral forms of witness that are immeasurable and intangible, giving people a sense of vision and a sense of hope. Now, it's true, as I said before, that uh, I, I really don't see what I'm doing being the major reason or cause that a fascism would take over in America. It's just not the case. We've got 47% of Americans who want to vote for fascists. And, and if Biden can't generate any kind of appeal and so forth, then you're going to make 
the third party figure fully responsible for the catastrophe? No, 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 not at all. Not at all. I look at the world very differently in that regard. But I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to listen. And we'll just have to see what happens. We still have a year and a month before the election. And I will be in that election till the very end. So we shall see. Now, Chairs, we are just about out of time, but a quick mm. campaign update. If you thought things were going from bad to worse for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis <laughs> and his campaign for the presidency, you'd be right. For months, the internet has been abuzz with rumours that he wears lifts in his boots to appear taller. It even became the focus of a very awkward podcast interview this week with Patrick Bet David and... You had to feel sorry for the DeSantis staffer who booked him on that podcast, or probably ex-staffer by now. <laughs> Take a look. I've seen you walk with these boots. Go ahead and play this clip. This on TikTok went viral. It doesn't have a million views. It doesn't have, you know, 10 million views. This thing's got 1.2 million likes. And and some people are wondering... How, what how, are they? I don't even... I so haven't what, seen that. What there's... They have not shown this to you. Okay, no. what they're trying to say with this is that in your boots, you have heels. No, no, no. That's yeah, what no, no to those say. are just standard off the rack um, Lucchese. Um, uh, how, how, Lucchese tall are you? how tall are you, Governor? How tall 5'11. Are you? 5'11. Okay. Why don't you wear tennis shoes and dress shoes? Uh, I do wear tennis shoes when I work out. Yeah. 100%. You do? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so the old expression goes when you're explaining, you're losing. Yeah. When you're explaining, you're not wearing lifts in your boots, you are really losing. Yeah, yeah. What, what's the chances that he hadn't seen that? Oh, what are you talking about? Oh, oh really? Oh, yeah. oh, my entire campaign's online, but uh, I haven't noticed this, this, this viral story. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, i got to say a couple of things about this. Sure. First of all, if he claims to be 5'11, mm. The 1999 Yale baseball team had stats yes. of which he was a member. His height was registered as 5'11". Yep. Back then, 1999. Sure. He wasn't running for president. Yep. Okay? So that's the first thing. Yeah. And the second thing is this screams Trump campaign dirty pool. Like, it's just classic skullduggery. You mm. look at the people who are online who are boosting this, they're all Trump supporters. Mm. Uh, it's just, yeah, it, it's... I mean, I don't know whether he's wearing lifts or whether he's not. Who cares? Mm. But, yeah, it's just it's just a classic kind of Trump campaign thing where they want to talk about something that bullies in the schoolyard would talk about yeah. as opposed to policy. Well, kudos to him because if in 1999 he was also wearing lifts to be 5'11", <laughs> that's quite a mean feat, playing baseball in lifts. And <laughs> at the end of the day, he's six inches shorter than Donald Trump because even though Donald Trump lies about his weight, yes. his height is 6'5". Donald Trump is a tall guy and he will make Ron DeSantis, if they ever appear on a debate stage together, mm. they probably won't, <laughs> but if they do, he will look short by comparison. Hey, I'll just say on behalf of the DeSantis campaign here, because mm -hmm. he's not here, he's off getting his lifts measured, <laughs> Trump is, I believe, 6'3", not 6'5". Yeah, yeah, I think you're right, absolutely right. <laughs> but, um, like I said, the Trump campaign's pushing this. Mm. Don Jr is one of them, and he's come up with the most... Because you might go, why does this matter? Mm. Even by your standards, Don Jr., yeah. why does this matter? Sure. He's come up with the most ridiculous reason why this is supposedly relevant to a primary campaign, and it's this. Uh, and there's those, oh, I can't believe you'd criticise him for, for wearing boots. No, no, no. I'm criticising that mentality. It's that insecurity. Okay, if you're that insecure, just... If you're 5'7", whatever he is, like, own it, right? That insecurity on a world stage is not going to work out well for us. That's the kind of stuff that gets us into wars eventually. Apparently, <laughs> the lifts are going to get us into World War III. Yeah, well, you know, Franklin <laughs> Roosevelt was in a wheelchair. Maybe we wouldn't have had the Second World War. <laughs> I don't know what he's oh, thinking. God. That's it for another Fireside Chat. Do join us Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. on ABC TV for another trip to Planet America and back here by the Fireside next Friday night on ABC News. Both shows are also on ABC, iView, YouTube and Facebook. And there's a new pet podcast for you right there in all the usual pod places. Bye-bye.